Good morning, North Lake Baptist Church. It's so good to see you. You are lovely this morning. Uh, It's a beautiful Lord's Day that the Lord has blessed us with, and I hope you are excited about worshiping our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ this morning. Uh, Guests, we want to welcome you and thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, We have uh, some ushers this morning that have a gift bag for you, and so we would ask you to kindly raise your hand so we could get that gift bag to you. Uh, There's a visitor's card in there that we would ask you to fill out and place in the offering plate in just a moment so we could uh, make contact, reach out uh, with you uh, later on in the week to get to know you better. So thank you, ushers and guests. Uh, Church, uh, let's open up our bulletins at this time and look at our week of ministry. Uh, Students, uh, don't forget... Even though it's a little bit overcast and they may be talking about rain, well, you're going to get wet anyway. We're having a pool party this afternoon at 2.30, and as long as there's no lightning, we're good to go. So uh, be sure to meet us here at the church at 2.30, and we'll head out uh, for our uh, back-to-school party. Uh, Choir, you're practicing at 4.30 this afternoon. Hey, now is a great time if you've been thinking about joining the choir. Now would be a great time, wouldn't it, Brother Derek? All right, so come on this afternoon at 4.30. Uh, Wednesday night, we have our normal activities, uh, youth, adult Bible study, and kids' uh, Bible study will uh, occur this Wednesday. You won't want to miss being with Mindy and Corbin. And speaking of our children's ministry, our children's ministry, we're having more children, and we're needing more volunteers, so that is a, a good thing. And so our children's ministry director, Miss Mindy Henderson, will be in the back of the sanctuary. Uh, if you're thinking about uh, how you could get involved in our children's ministry and volunteer with our children's ministry, she would love to talk to you at the end of the service. And you can see her uh, just at the back of the sanctuary at the end of the service. Uh, we also have some Awana dates uh, to remember. Uh, August 24th, uh, leader meeting, uh, the 31st. Uh, the Awana Registration and Ice Cream Social. And then also on August 28th, uh, make sure you've written this down on your calendar where we will get together and celebrate uh, Pastor Danny's ministry uh, with Pastor Danny and Miss Laura. I want to remind you, church, that this is a fully catered event. Uh, so we want you to come and just enjoy uh, time together Uh, as a church family and so don't worry about uh, bringing food uh, or setting up we're going to get it all taken care of just come and enjoy the evening church I think that does it for our announcements the psalmist reminds us in Psalm 119 blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord blessed are those who keep his testimonies who seek him with the whole heart, who seek him with the whole heart. Church, will you join me as I pray? O Lord, our God, holy is your name. You and you alone are worthy of all honor and praise. Father, today as we worship, teach us your ways, Lord, that we may walk in them. Lord, may our hearts long for righteousness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. You've heard the phrase, uh, you don't have to be crazy to work here, we'll train you. Well, the choir's not like that, but you don't have to know music to come and be a part of the choir each week. We're going to train you. And not only that, we want you to come for a weekly pick-me-up of worship uh, for as we rehearse each week for uh, our music and upcoming services. So won't you come and be a part? Come join us at 4.30. Uh, again, we can have a space. If we don't have one, we will make one. So we want you to come and be a part. Come and join us and join a, a great time of fellowship each Sunday evening at 4.30. We would love to, love to see you there. One of the things that... Uh, we do each week or I strive to do each week and encourage our choir to do is to worship the Lord with all that is in you Uh, and part of that is asking him to reign in you now it's one thing to ask him to come and live in your heart it's something totally different 
if you come and ask him to live and reign in your heart. And having someone reign in your heart means they are guiding you and directing you and telling you, showing you the path you should take. And so my desire for you and God's desire most importantly for you is that you let him guide you each and every day. Uh, I'm reminded in Psalm 97, verse 1, it says, The Lord reigns, and let the earth rejoice, and let the multitudes be glad. If you skip on down to verse 9 of Psalm 97, it says, For you, Lord, are most high above the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. You who love the Lord hate evil, for he preserves the souls of his saints and he delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. If you want to know how to avoid the traps of life, uh, ask the Lord to reign in your heart and let him reign mightily. So let's sing about that this morning as we continue our time of worship. Lord, reign in me. Won't you stand with me?
And I also welcome you to the house of the Lord. So good to see you here this morning. If you have your bulletins, let's look at the back page at our prayer list. Got a great verse for this morning from Matthew 9, 37. Jesus said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. We usually use this verse this time of year to remind us it's ministry placement team time. And the good news is, is we already have a lot of folks that have volunteered to help take care of uh, 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 various ministries during the next year. We're three weeks away from the new church year beginning. And the good news is Miss Mindy, who's in charge of our ministry placement team this year, is saying that we've got good sign-ups, a lot of volunteers. But as we've already mentioned, uh, we need some help with our, with our children's ministries. And, of course, Miss Mindy's in charge of that as well. And she'll be in the back. Uh, and you can talk to her about uh, signing up and helping us out in that area for the next year. But do pray. And one of the things you find out if you read Matthew 9, those who pray end up volunteering to go into the field and do the Lord's work. So uh, make that a part of your prayer as well. We do praise the Lord for our baptism last week of uh, Brother Braden. Also, we continue to remember uh, those, uh, our one, on our list to pray for and to seek to win to faith in Jesus Christ. We continue to pray for our pastor search committee. Uh, you see those listed in our church family, and we got Eric Goodnight and David Stowe both spent time in the hospital this past week and have all gone home, so we pray for them uh, in their recovery. Uh, also, the last name there, Joyce Tate. Uh, I saw her this morning in Sunday school, so she's back from hip surgery. So continue to pray for her as uh, she heals up and gets well. Uh, we continue to pray for our parents who are expecting children. Uh, also, under extended family and friends, uh, Miss Betty Gaddy's grandson, Wes Talley, had a motorcycle accident Friday night. Uh, he sustained a broken arm and some bruises and a concussion, but he is now at home recovering, so be in prayer for him. Also, under long-term care, the third line down, you see Tom Johnson, and he was diagnosed with prostate cancer this past week, so be in prayer for Brother Tom. Also, I want to pray for our missionaries serving around the world, and today we have a praise from the International Mission Board. Some of our missionaries in South Korea uh, have been meeting people and leading them to faith in Jesus Christ through English classes. Uh, I guess everybody in the world wants to learn English, and so they come to learn English, and they share Jesus Christ with them, and so uh, uh, what a ministry. Also, I want to continue to pray for our nation, our president, and all that's going on in the world, and also remember it's back to school time, so be in prayer for our schools as they begin with our teachers, and our bus drivers, staff, students, everyone as they go back to school. Also, one other thing that I wanted to add is pray for uh, Sister church in our area, Bethlehem uh, Baptist, up in Dahlonega. Uh, they've asked me to lead in revival this week, so I'll be uh, preaching tonight through Thursday night at 7 o'clock there. So be in prayer that the Lord blesses them with what they're praying for, and that is a revival in their church and among believers there. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day that you blessed us with, this opportunity to gather in this summer day with brothers and sisters in Christ in this place and worship you, the true and living God. Lord, we do thank you for the way that you've blessed the membership here at North Lake Baptist Church as we work together to love and serve you. Lord, we pray this morning, if there's someone here that's never trusted Christ their Savior and Lord, that today is the day that they would be saved and begin their journey to the kingdom of heaven uh, forever with you. We pray for those on our prayer list that need a special touch of your grace for healing today. And Lord, we're trusting you to minister that according to your good will and purpose. And bless us as we continue to worship you, for you are worthy of it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to remind you at this time that uh, our kids can be dismissed to Children's Church. Uh, this year might be a little different, though, because we have just had Promotion Sunday. So if you are a kindergartner through third grade, you may head on out to our Children's Church uh, just through this door here and meet uh, Brother Corbin and his team, and they'll be glad to get you headed that way this morning for Children's Church. So we'll let y'all head on out uh, as we continue our time of worship. <laughs>
I entered the gates, I cried holy.
Well, somebody say glory. glory. Amen. Somebody ought to be able to preach behind that. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, please open to Matthew 22. And I'd love to preach about heaven, but here Jesus is telling us we've got some stuff we've got to do on earth first. But still we have that blessed hope of heaven in the future where we'll cry holy and sing glory to our Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 22, as we make our progress through this uh, New Testament gospel, three Sundays left. I don't think I'm going to be able to finish Matthew. <laughs> so I've chosen a few scriptures in Matthew to focus on as I finish my time here with you. Uh, since I won't be here for midterm elections in November, I thought I would jump ahead <laughs> and look at what Jesus had to say uh, on politics. So let's begin in verse 15 of Matthew 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him, that is Jesus, in his talk. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, the government folks, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth, nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. Always be careful when they begin with flattery. They're fixing to get you. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius, and he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Then they heard these words, they marveled, and left him and went their way. The scripture is just another example of how the Bible is relevant to the human condition. Whether it's in the first century or the 21st century, people don't like to pay taxes, amen? So again, uh, this is right down our alley, it works for us. But in Matthew 22, 15, it's much more than that. This is another one of those traps for Jesus. Last time we saw the chief priests and the scribes try to trap Jesus concerning his tirade in the temple where he overthrew the money changers. And they asked him, by what authority did you do that? And again, that was a trap because if he had said, well, I did it on my own authority, they said, you don't have any authority, and they'd have killed him. And if he said, well, I did it on the authority of God because I'm his son, then they would accuse him of blasphemy and went ahead and killed him too. So again, it was a... Uh, it was one of those uh, horns of a dilemma thing. Well, it's the same way here. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? This is another dilemma. If Jesus said yes, uh, then the crowd would turn against him because the Roman occupation and taxation in the land of Israel was very unpopular uh, to average folks. And if Jesus said no, then the chief priests would go to the Romans and the Herodians who were already in the crowd and tell them that Jesus is trying to overthrow the Roman government. And, of course, have him arrested for that. So Jesus answers, Render to Caesar, therefore, the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. So Jesus is saying, Both God and government have authority over you, so pay your dues to both. Well, what do we owe the government? Well, look at the dollar, Jesus says. Whose image is on it? You see, presidents and former government leaders, the image on our money reminds us that without a stable government, you don't have any money. God provides human government to give us an environment to do business and to make money. And good government gives people an environment of peace, law and order, safety and security, education and transportation. Without these things, there is no economy. There is no job. There is no money. There is no peace or safety. If you don't believe it, travel to some third world country. Travel to some war-torn country like uh, Ukraine or Afghanistan. Try to set up shop there and see how it works out for you. So again, what do we owe the government? We owe taxes in order to keep the economy running. So what do we owe God? Well, Jesus said, look at yourself. Whose image are you? According to Genesis 1:27, you are made in the image of God. And the apostles tell us in Acts 17, 28, in him, in God, we live and we move, and we have our being. So we owe God everything. Even the government ultimately comes from God. Jesus on trial before Pilate in John chapter 19, verse 10 said, Pilate said to him, Jesus, are you sp not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you or the power to release you? And what did Jesus say? 
You could have no power at all unless it's given to you from above. So in Matthew 22, Jesus is telling the Jews, and he's also telling us to quit griping, give your taxes to the government, give your life to God. Now the Jews were griping because they thought that since they were God's chosen people, that they should never have to have a Gentile government ruling over them. But you know, the Bible tells us in so many ways, using so many examples, that people get the government they deserve. If you honor God, then God will give you good government. If you forget God, then he will allow your enemies to reign over you, which is why Israel at that time was being occupied by the Romans. Nevertheless, God was going to use the Romans to fulfill his plan and his purposes. Well, that's all well and good for the first century, but what does the Lord teaching about God and government apply? Does that apply to us in the United States of America? Well, 250 years ago, God heard the cries of oppression from the English colonists in America and performed a miracle. What he did is he allowed a poorly trained and equipped American militia to win a war against the British, who at the time had the largest empire and the greatest army in the world. Even though our revisionist historians deny it, the United States of America was established on Christian principles. I guess they can debate whether or not all of our founders were dedicated Christians, but you cannot debate that our founders had a Christian worldview and morality. You can go to wallbuilders.com and see over 50 quotes from our founding fathers, from Revolutionary War soldiers to the signers of the Declaration of Independence to the uh, signers of U.S. Constitution who acknowledge the God of the Bible and Jesus Christ in particular. The Bible was the basis of their understanding of justice and righteousness, and together with the Bible, their study of various forms of government in history, they developed a form of government with a balance of powers called a representative democracy of the people, by the people, and for the people, where citizens were allowed to vote and have a voice in their government. This form of government has not been perfect, but it has for, allowed more freedom, peace, and prosperity for a greater percentage of the people than any government in the history of the world. Amen. But like Israel of old, once God begins to bless and prosper people, there's a tendency to take those blessings for granted and receive the blessings and forget the blesser. And that's what happened to Israel, and that's what happened in the United States of America today. Rather than being thankful and content with what we have, we as human beings tend to focus on what we do not have. And in the Bible, the Lord tells us that when we become unthankful and God disconnected uh, or discontented with God and choose to forget God, that we will be defeated by our enemies. And that process has already begun, even in my lifetime. 66 years ago when I was born, America just had fought a stalemate against the socialists in North Korea who were backed by socialists in Russia and China. When I was a teenager, America was fighting uh, so, uh, against socialism in Vietnam, again, backed by the socialists in Russia and China. When I was in elementary school, we practiced duck and cover drills where we crawled under our desk, which was supposed to somehow protect us from Russian socialists who might launch a 250 megaton nuclear missile that could in 30 minutes vaporize large portions of America. As an army officer, I served in the Cold War against the Russians, known then as the USSR, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. But now we have an American political party with a short memory that is openly advertising itself as the Democratic Socialist Party. In the 2016 and 2020 presidential elections, Bernie Sanders ran as a Democratic Socialist. He almost won the Democrat nomination and came in twice, came in second twice. In the 2020 campaign, Bernie agreed to concede the nomination to Joe Biden if Joe Biden agreed to a 110-page progressive policy list from Bernie. And of course, we now know that that's what became the playbook for the Biden administration. The policy list looked very similar to Bernie's website, which described what he meant what, that it means to be a democratic socialist or social justice. Bernie says, we need a revolution. Oh, Bernie's always hollering for a revolution. But anyway, he said, we need a revolution because there's too much unfairness and injustice in America. The government has a responsibility to ensure that every American is living on a level playing field, which includes 
universal basic income for all, that is welfare for everybody, where everybody gets a salary uh, just for breathing, just for being alive. Universal health care, which is Medicare for all. Free education from child care all the way to college. Affordable housing, whatever that means. Equal access to technology and infrastructure, no matter where you live. Equal rights for women, minorities, migrants, and LGBTQs, and whatever else they add to the list today. He promises all this will be done in an environmentally friendly way, or else we'll all be dead from global climate change by 2030. Also, how's all this going to be paid for? We're talking about a lot of money here on this list, and it's going to be paid for by the Robin Hood method. We're going to take from the rich and give to the poor. And his Democrat Socialist government will be the referee who decides when the playing field is sufficiently level and everyone is equal. And of course, with all those freebies, what's not to love about socialism? And it turns out a lot of people in the United States of America are starting to believe that. In a 2018 Gallup poll, it said over 50% of 18 to 29-year-olds now have a positive view of socialism. Many Christians are loving it too. With all this free stuff, this caring, this sharing, this equality, some are saying this democratic socialism is the kingdom of God on earth. Some even go so far to say Jesus was the first socialist or that Jesus was a social justice warrior. So I thought maybe for a few minutes, let's turn off our news feeds, our social media, and our socialist propaganda and look at the word of God because sometimes socialists use our vocabulary, they just don't use our dictionary. So let's see what socialists mean by social justice, and let's see what Jesus meant when he said social justice. In the Bible, the words for justice, judgment, righteousness are almost synonyms. They mean virtually the same thing. Justice is doing what is right in the sight of God. Justice is doing what is right according to the word of God. Jesus describes God's justice and righteousness as follows. In Matthew chapter 22, if you still have your Bibles open, if you look down to verse 37, Jesus said, This is what justice is. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is likened to it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus said, Do not think I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy it, but to fulfill. So let's go back to the law and the prophets uh, that was given by God through Moses in which Jesus quotes throughout the Gospels. And I guess the best place I thought to pick from is Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is Moses' sermon file. So if you have your Bibles, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is a good summary of the law and the prophets. We'll start in Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 17. You shall not show partiality in judgment. You shall hear the small as well as the great. You shall not be afraid in any man's presence, for the judgment is God's. So God's judgment is impartial in applying God's laws to all situations. If a person is right, they're right. If they're wrong, they're wrong. Regardless of whether they're rich or poor, regardless of whether they're powerful or weak, regardless of whether they're male or female, regardless of their skin color, regardless of which side of the railroad tracks they live on. Leviticus 19, 15, you shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor shall you honor the person of the mighty. In righteousness, you shall judge your neighbor. Even when you get to the New Testament, when it comes down to the social programs like feeding the widows and the poor, uh, we're told that you look at it on a need, case-by-case -case basis. Have they fallen on hard times and are sick, or else are they just reaping the wages of their sin? Are they able to work, or are they disabled? Uh, check them out according to their need, is what we're told in the Scriptures. But when you get to this new socialist justice, they say that the rich are always wrong and the poor is always right. Socialist justice doesn't ask any questions. All they know is... This guy hasn't got any money, but a neighbor down the street has got money, so it's not fair, therefore we need a revolution. So let's burn down the nation until everyone is equal. Look on now to Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 13. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. Verse 19, you shall not steal. According to God's definition of justice, it says that people who are able are supposed to work for a living, and what you earn from your work is yours. 
to use as the Lord leads. Even in the New Testament, Ephesians 4, 28, labor, working with your hands what is good, that you may be having something to give to him who has need. So each person has a responsibility to work for themselves, to provide basic income for our families, child care for our families, health care for our families, education for our families, and also to help those who are in need. And as we work and accumulate wealth, the commandment that says thou shalt not steal means God has given us the right to private property. But socialist justice does not believe in private property. Indeed, the socialist communist Karl Marx said the government should take from each according to his ability and give to each according to his needs, which is a perversion of Exodus chapter 16 and verse 16, which is the uh, miracle of manna. Let every man gather according to each one's needs is what was told because in the miracle of manna, manna in the wilderness was not given to be an economic policy for a nation. It was a twofold miracle, first to feed the children of Israel and secondly to teach them Deuteronomy 8.3 and that is that man does not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Look on to Deuteronomy now chapter 5 and verse 15. It's repeated several times in these scriptures. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand. Again, God's justice reminds us that it was God who helped us win our wars and to enjoy the blessings of freedom. And so the Lord gives us a social consciousness, which is summarized in Leviticus 19:18 and quoted by Jesus, and that is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So when you see someone in need, Deuteronomy 15, 11 says, you shall open your hand wide to your brother, to your poor, and to your needy. That's what we call God's justice. But socialist justice takes the responsibility away from the individual and makes the government responsible for all of those things. Socialist justice does not want you to give freely to the poor. It waits for the government to take your money in the form of taxes, and then they redistribute it the way that they see fit. You know, back in 2019, Warren Buffett, who is the mega investor at that time worth $81 billion, said, I think that people at the high end, people like myself, should be paying a lot more taxes. And everybody cheered for him. But I couldn't help but think, uh, Mr. Buffett, why not voluntarily give to help the poor, the widows, the orphans, instead of waiting on the government to take it out of your taxes? You know, there's an answer for it. You know why Buffett likes to talk like that and a lot of other rich politicians love to talk about that? Is because he knows his wealth is tied up in a tax a sheltered foundation, so he pays no tax. Always amuses me to say rich people say the rich should be paying more tax. Sure they do, because they're not going to pay any tax because they got up tied up in a for foundation. If you want to do a little history on that, go all the way back to the robber barons like Carnegie and Rockefeller. They all have these foundations where they don't pay a nickel tax all taxation is going to come from working people. So just so you know that. All right, moving on. Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 16. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, that your days may be long and that it may be well with you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Verse 18, you shall not commit adultery. So here we see God's justice and he tells us to protect the family unit. Human sexuality should only be expressed in marriage covenant between a man and a woman who join together to be responsible to provide for their family. Provide things like faith, food, clothing, housing, child care, education, health care for their family. And these strong families become the building blocks for a great nation. God's justice also requires his people to care for broken homes caused by the death of a father or mother. Nine times in Deuteronomy, God's justice requires us to care for the widow and the fatherless with no means of support. But socialist justice says we don't need God's old-fashioned, out-of-date family model. The government can take care of all of our needs from womb to tomb. Let the government manage families through Planned Parenthood. And what does Planned Parenthood say? That we got too many people on the globe right now. Planned Parenthood says we need more sex without babies, which is why they promote abortion rights, contraceptive rights, pornography, homosexuality, transgender, transgenderism, etc. After all, you know, it's hard to have babies when people can't tell whether they're a male or a female. And it's also when men are long, no longer attracted to women and women are no longer attracted to men, pretty soon, no babies. Also, feminism is a branch of socialism because if socialists can talk women 
into the idea of forsaking the idea of being a godly wife and mother who raised children to love and serve the Lord, then in a couple of generations, they'll be able to achieve the socialist globalist dream of a godless new world order. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 11. For the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command thee, saying, You shall open your hand wide unto your brother, to the poor and the needy in your land. See, that's God's justice. God's justice said there will always be poor people. Sounds hard. But he said there's going to always be poor people. Therefore God is watching to see what we will do to help those in need. Will we love our neighbor? Will we care for our neighbor? And we're going to be judged accordingly. But socialist justice said poverty can be eradicated. We can get rid of poverty by taking from the rich and redistributing it to the poor. We can all balance it out. But the question is, is which idea is true? God's way or the socialist way? Well, according to the laws of mathematics, there is a law, I'm not a math major, but there is a law I came familiar with, and that's called the law of normal distribution, also known as the bell-shaped curve that says that God is right and the socialists are wrong. How many of you remember being in school? Teachers give a test, and the results always come out in the form of a bell-shaped curve. You ever remember that? Did you pay that much attention? Did you know what part of the bell-shaped curve you were in when those grades came out? But nevertheless, that's, that's pretty much the, the way everything works out in society. You'll have a few A's, a few F's, and a whole bunch of B, C's, and D's in the middle. And the same is true in a normal population. Uh, there will be a relatively small number of rich people, a relatively small number of poor people, and then a whole bunch of folks in, in the middle. Uh, that's true even though after a socialist revolution, even after Bernie has his revolution, guess what? Your society will still come out into a bell-shaped curve. The only difference will be is the socialist will murder the former rich national leaders, and then they'll redistribute that bell-shaped curve, and you'll have the socialist at the top, still have poor at the bottom, and a whole bunch of people in the middle. So that's the way that works out. And by the way, 1964, I was in the second, going to third grade in that time, how many of you are old enough to remember Lyndon Johnson declaring war on poverty? How's that working for you? $22 trillion worth of tax money later, guess what? They tell us we got more poor people today than we ever had before. So again, I think we go back to God's word true, let man be a liar. Deuteronomy chapter 15, and verse 5. If you carefully obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe with care all these commandments, then the Lord your God will bless you just as he has promised you. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. You shall reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over you. So God's justice teaches both to individuals and to nations that we need to learn to live within our means and do not borrow money. But socialist justice operates a different way. Socialism does not teach doing good deeds with your own money. Socialism teaches doing good deeds with other people's money. Uh, if you'll remember, though, British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher years ago said the problem with socialism is that you eventually run out of other people's money. And that's where we are in America today. Before we fully install socialism, we already have become a debtor nation. Our national debt is over $30 trillion. Yes, the annual interest payment on that is $300 billion. Going to who? International bankers somewhere. Remember, they don't allow you to audit the Fed, so we don't know exactly where all those $300 billion go, but I can bet you one thing, it buys a bunch of power. Now move on to Deuteronomy 27 and 28. It gives us a list of blessings if you'll obey the commandments of God and curses if you disobey the commandments of God. And here's the key to why capitalism works and socialism does not work and will not work. Capitalism is based on a the biblical doctrine called total human depravity, and that is that man is basically a sinner. Unless you reward him for doing right or punish him for doing wrong, he tends to be selfish and look out for number one. Now, is that a good reason for capitalism to work? I don't think so, but nevertheless, that's why capitalism works. Socialism, though, on the other hand, says that man is basically good at heart, and whether or not he's rewarded, he will always do the right thing. Is that true? Suppose when we get this new socialist system uh, you know, installed here in the United States of America, you get up at 7 o'clock in the morning, 
You go down to do a job you really don't have to go and do because you're being given a universal basic income, which is the same as everybody else's, but you're a good citizen, so you want to go down and work some government job uh, to feel good about yourself. So anyway, you get up at 7 o'clock in the morning, you go down and work your job to sundown, but you get home and find out your next-door neighbor has sat at home all day watching TV or playing video games. And the government pays both of you the same monthly income. Why did it get quiet in here? How many of y'all would call that system just and fair and right? Former President Ronald Reagan summarized socialism, communism. He said it only works in heaven where they don't need it and in hell where they've already got it. And that's the problem with it. That's why socialism will never work. Deuteronomy 32, Song of Moses. It's a song warning about what happens to nations that forget God. The song begins with how God has blessed Israel, carried her on eagle's wings to a prosperous land that flows with milk and honey. Then he describes what happens when that nation forgets God. Deuteronomy 32 warns that forgetting God leads to an environmental crisis when the land will be destroyed. This new God, this new religion called socialism is godless. It is a theory that Adam tried in the Garden of Eden once Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, instead of waiting for the voice of God to come walking in the cool of the day, Adam should have ran toward the presence of God in the heat of the day and said, Oh, Lord, I have sinned. I have made a mess. Can you come and help fix this thing? But that's not what he did. Remember what did he and Eve do? They made aprons of fig leaves. We can cover our sin. We can fix it. Nobody will ever know. God will never know. Socialism is another fig leaf doctrine. It looks around and sees the world that's in a mess. But instead of running to God and saying, Oh, Lord, we've made a mess, it says, We can fix it ourselves. We can fix the earth ourselves. We can save the planet ourselves. That's the new religion. We don't need God. And, brothers and sisters, there is a clear and present danger of socialism. Historically, when socialists gain control, they don't want to hear any other opinions beside their own especially any opinions that are related to God because it's an anti-Christian doctrine. The University of Hawaii has a website called Democide that reports that over 110 million people were murdered by communist socialist governments in the 20th century. So the whole idea that democratic socialism fosters freedom, equality, democracy, prosperity have all proven to be false. Even in the last 50 years, we have watched it as it morphed in the United States of America. When socialists were in the minority, they were always whining about how Christians were so intolerant, so closed-minded, so hateful to all other opinions. But now that they have over 50% of the population, they're no longer tolerant or open to other opinions. They protest, they riot, they shout down, they cancel opposing opinions on college campuses, streets of our cities, even the halls of Congress. And that's why they're not yet totally in power. Just wait until they own the White House and both houses of Congress. And that's why, brothers and sisters, Christians need to get out and vote and prevent socialism from taking the White House and the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. Amen. But one thing that socialists do have right, and that is America is headed for an environmental crisis. But our environmental crisis will not come because we emitted too much carbon dioxide or methane it will be because we forgot God. According to Deuteronomy 32, the Lord will destroy us and our land in his wrath. You may be saying, well, Danny, what can we do? What can we do at this point? Well, turn back to Deuteronomy 31. Deuteronomy 31 and verse 12. Gather the people together, the men, women, and little ones, and the stranger who is within your gates, that they may hear and that they may learn to fear the Lord your God and carefully observe all the words of this law. Brothers and sisters, failure to do this is why America's in decline. Our generation and the last couple of generations have failed to carry out the great commission of our Lord to teach our children and evangelize the stranger that's within our gates with the word of God. Learning to obey God is our only hope, and we need to pass that along to our next generation. We need to teach our children the word and the ways of God. We need to pray for our children that even in the midst of God's judgment upon this nation that they may stand strong in the word 
and be faithful to the Lord. We need to vote for our children. In Jesus' time, people say, well, why didn't Jesus say vote? Very simple. They, you couldn't vote. The Roman system of government, you didn't have a voice in the government. But I think we need to vote for our children because in Jesus' time, they didn't have that opportunity. In those days, if you had a good Caesar, you prayed, God save the king. If you had a bad Caesar, you prayed, short live the king. But you had no other choice in the matter. If you protested, they just put you to the sword. But in America, we're still blessed to have the right to vote and to communicate with our leaders. And the Lord will hold us accountable on the day of judgment for what we did with our rights, our privileges, and the blessings he gave us. In Luke chapter 12, verse 42, Jesus said, To whom much is given, much is required. James chapter 4, verse 17 says, Him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. So as Jesus clearly pointed out where I began in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 21, if you're a Christian, then you're a citizen of two worlds. So as I near the end of my time with you, I encourage you as fellow Christians to be a good citizen of the United States of America by fulfilling your responsibilities to our Lord and for our children and grandchildren to get out and vote against the socialist agenda that is sweeping through our land. The socialist uh, is a philosophy that destroys nations. It is also a theology that turns the government into a god. It is antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ and everywhere it's ever been tried, it always ends up being a threat and an enemy to the church. Amen. I also encourage you as a fellow Christian to be a faithful citizen of the kingdom of heaven which requires our primary loyalty and allegiance above anything else because when there is a difference between what God demands and what our government demands, then we must obey God rather than man, it says in Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Why? Because Jesus is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the president above all presidents, and he shall reign forever and ever. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Father, help us not to forget you. So many in our country already have. Lord, we pray that as Christians, as your people, that we would not forget you, but to always remember you. And Lord, to obey your word and keep your commandments. Lord, help us to pray for our government leaders, for we realize that even their lives are still in your hand and you're in charge and you're on the throne. Lord, help us to be responsible for the blessings you have given us and to vote your principles of righteousness so that we and our children and our children's children shall not perish from this good land that you have blessed us with. Lord, whatever happens, we pray that we, your people, would be found faithful till you come. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now is our time of invitation. Our altar's open if you need to come and pray. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ, your Savior and Lord, you need to do it, and you need to do it today. We have no promise of tomorrow, and again, if you study the end times, I don't know the exact day or the hour, but I do know we're 2,000 years closer than when this book was read that said that Jesus Christ was coming. So soon and very soon, we're going to see the King. And if you've never trusted Christ, your Savior, you're going to be in trouble if you're left behind. So won't you trust Him today? Maybe you've already been saved, never made a profession of faith, uh, walked the aisle, joined a church, been baptized to declare which side you're on in this spiritual war. Won't you do that today? Maybe you've been saved and baptized and your church membership is somewhere else and you feel like the Lord is leading you to come here, find your place of service. Won't you join our church today? Maybe there's some other issue on your mind. I'll be standing up front to pray with you. Our altar's open. And you can pray and know that we have praying people across the building that without knowing your, be uh, your business will be asking the Lord to bless you. So won't you listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit as he speaks to your heart during this holy time of invitation. Won't you stand? Won't you come? Who can cheer the heart like Jesus by his presence all
fills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. And the fairest of 10,000, in my blessed Lord I see. continue to play. Had a young fella come down here, already made his profession of faith in Jesus Christ, and it's not too late. The Lord's speaking to your heart. Don't put it off. Don't let the devil talk you into next week. How many of you know for sure you got next week? You say, we don't. So the Lord's speaking to your heart. Behold, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. So if you just bow your head, close your eyes, we'll play through this song one more time. If no one comes, we'll close the service. I want to give you the opportunity to do that. and you want to come up and stand with me? Mom and Dad and Sister can come up too. They're over here. Hey, you got to be in the middle so everybody can see you. <laughs> yeah. He's seven years old. I tell him I uh, made my profession of faith when I was seven years old, and I felt the same way. So don't worry about being a little nervous because everybody here is excited about you. How many of y'all rejoice in Jackson's little <laughs> profession of faith today? Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to ask y'all to come back and stand with me so all these folks can welcome you uh, into our church family. And let's see who's, uh, Tim's going to be uh, leading us in prayer today. Again, uh, 
don't forget about the sermon today. There's a lot going on in this country right now. I don't know if you're paying any attention. As Billy Graham used to say, you need to have a Bible in one hand, a newspaper in the other, and be praying about both things here. Uh, make it a matter of prayer. Also, as a good Christian citizen of this nation, uh, get yourself in shape to pray and to vote and to be a good citizen according to the principles of God, not necessarily the principles of this world. Amen? Amen. So let's prepare for that. Tim, lead us in prayer, please. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for during our time that we have the Bible that we can go to to see and feel all the things that went on during uh, the time of Jesus walking this earth. Father, I do pray that we'll open that book more times than the newspaper. Father, for it has blessings and it has curses. And Father, if we don't read the book, curses will come our way. Father, I thank you for a pastor that's bold enough to speak the word, to live the word, and pray for us that need to read the word as well. We ask all in Jesus' name. Amen.